Art is extremely powerful. It's amazing, it's transformative, and it's one of the first things that I discovered when I was welcomed into a local open mic to share my poetry, welcomed in and encouraged to share my truth. And it's in that moment that I was given an opportunity to let people know about the things that were going on inside of me. And to be given an opportunity to reconcile the things that had influenced me and shaped me and made me into the person that I am. One of those being my relationship with my father. See, my father kept his whole life in a brown bag, squeezed tight at the top to hold his dreams in and held up to his mouth to drown his sorrows and wash away his pain. Facing every day full on liquid courage and kept his potential in a brown bag. Sin laughed on neighborhood street corners, wisdom spoke in slurred speech, and young eyes learned way too early that nobody beats the bull. Three dollars for ice cream from the ice cream shop, two dollars for a slit smart liquor bull from the corner store, five dollars from a battered and withered wallet, 20 minutes spent between father and son was priceless. That man works for a living. His living was in that brown bag, no child support payment, school clothes, no little league refreshments, basketball shoes or football cleats, no roses on Valentine's Day, only wild Irish because mad dogs see street life with 20-20 vision. Trapped in a Boone's farm, 40 acres and a mule is 40 ounces. And this man pissing away his life, love, and child's admiration while sitting on park benches as time ticks and he's hung over like necks hung from nooses. Responsibility is prejudice, leaving burnt bridges on his tomorrows and white sheets on his understanding his future is dying. His liver is dying, his hope is dying, his son is crying, his mother is crying, and optimism is hopeless. There are no half empties or half fulls. He only sees the world in pints, in fifths. Guzzles less like six packs, works construction all day, six baby mothers, eight children, no remorse. Heavy hands smacks brown sisters, loves, loves brown bags. And then he puts everything that he has. So don't tell me about heartache and pain until you see it happen. Just go at the bottom of a bottle and come with every open top. Don't tell me about obsession until you wake up one morning and realize you can't stop. When sobriety is worse than insanity and you wake up every day straight, no chasing. When your melanin is corrupted by wheat and barley and your first son grows under your nose and your first love hardly recognizes you anymore when the bag that you claim claims you like corner store treasure, and you run out of time. And I wish that I could pour out a little liquor for you, but I can't stand to have your blood on my hands holding on to your grim reaper. So I try to sit and remember the good times and realize that you didn't leave me any good times behind, no memories, no legacies, no accolades. All you left me was a brown bag and an empty bottle of wine. That poem was Brown Bag Daddy. And it's one of the first poems that I became known for. And what it was was my catharsis. It was a way to be able to engage in a dialogue with the audience and share the things that had been going on with me, but also to find, to find others who had been going through the same thing so we could all realize that we were all overcomers. And most artists, they come to their medium for just that reason, because it gives them a capacity to be able to share, but it also creates a reciprocal relationship with the audience where they get to give and receive where people are willing to sit, hear everything that they have to offer, hear all the ideas and things that are going on inside of them. So imagine if those voices are from the margins. Think about what's possible. And think about what that art can be and how it may have a capacity for encouraging change. So just for a moment, consider this. Say you go out to a restaurant. Food comes to the table. It's not good. The service is bad. You're going to do one of two things. Leave it, leave the restaurant, till all your friends never go there and never go back again. Or you're going to voice your displeasure with the wait staff or the manager. You order a product, it comes to your house, it doesn't work. You're going to do one of two things. Send it back, never to use that product again, switch to another product, or call customer service, and you expect a solution, a resolution, a process. See. In a book called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, Albert Hirschman talks about the ways that we react to a deterioration in our government, in our businesses, in our products. One is exit, which is where you leave the product, never to use it again, or you switch to a competing product, or voice, 
which is where you voice your displeasure and you talk about what you expect in terms for things to change. See, when you talk about a voice as a unique manner of expression, what you realize is that artists are our voice strategy for being able to articulate our reaction to the deterioration in our communities, in our lives, in our society. We are able to recontextualize these things in a way for people to see the impact of all the things we face each and every day. That is our power, to be able to offer this voice strategy for change. But what's even more amazing is when these voices come from so many different places because each voice is distinct to each artist. So what you have happen is that you have our scope of understanding expanded by seeing multiple artists talk about a particular issue because they give us a variety of vantage points and perspectives. That's what, draw, that's what drew me. That's what captured my attention when I thought about the voices that are pushed to the margins for things like income and poverty and race and class and identity and orientation for cultural beliefs, spiritual beliefs, practices and passions. When you take those voices from the edges, from the margins, and you think about what they can tell us, I just see so much possibility there. So I decided to get them together and I wanted us all to talk. I called the experience Radical Voice and Artistic Expression, part peer discussion, part workshop, and over the course of a year from December 2014 to January 2015, we were able to get together three times. And what we talked about was about all the things that were going on around us, that touch us as artists. Because we can't, we can't help but create when we see this happening. When we see bodies gunned down for just being, when we see people pushed to the side for just existing, when your identity and your lived reality is said to be worthless, that touches us as artists and we create. But there are also people who are out there organizing, who are creating movements and actions to fight back at those who say that we are less than. How do those two things connect? And that's what we talked about. So when I talk about radical voice, I'm talking about a distinct manner of expression that gets to the root or origin of an issue favoring political, social, and economic change. But the key, the key of it is redemptive and revolutionary transformation. That's for the individual and for the group. And I think that is possible with art. And that's what we talked about, having a radical voice. And now, there's something about that, because when you think about this whole idea, what you find is that all major social movements in this country have been chronicled in art and culture. So what happens when artists are not just responding, when they're just not an accent to a demonstration, when they're just not, you know, they're not, they're not something that highlights the achievements, when they are an integrated part of the strategy? What they can provide is ongoing inspiration, agitation, and they can be messengers. But that creative talent and ability that allows us to see things in unique ways and find the intersections, which is what we do in our art, can also be a part of building a stronger strategy for building mass movement. It can be a part of building a better campaign when we are from the edges and we are constantly thinking about what that means, we can sit at the table and be able to help you understand who you're overlooking when you develop your plan. Why not integrate the work from the voices that are most influenced by the oppression that you are fighting? Makes sense to me. So what I proposed was a multimedia, multi-genre response because Arts communities mirror the same kind of rhetoric and the same kind of inter intersection that you see in social movements. So why not foster collaboration? Because it's one thing for me as a poet to create art, but if I can integrate that with dance, with music, with visual art, then what we're trying to accomplish can be greater. And the other is the manufacture of dissent and agitation through the use of imagination because how we see the world dictates how we move. 
When an organization is forming, many form a vision statement. That vision statement helps them to form their mission statement because the mission is how they're going to accomplish the vision. Artists help you see the world. And if we can help you see the world in a particular way, then what it does is it informs your daily decisions, your actions, your movements. And we can guide you towards the actualization of that vision. So if we want to see change, then there are a body of artists who are talking about the many ways that we can change, the many ways that we can grow, the many ways that we can heal, the many ways that we can do things differently. So why don't we integrate that into the movements that we want to build and the actions that we're taking to really change this world? Give people something that they can see, and then from there we can help them to believe that it's possible, and we can give them the skills to make it tangible. And it becomes a constant reminder of what you are fighting for. It becomes, it becomes that dream that you can't let go of, whether you are awake or whether you are asleep. And I believe that that is what we have in front of us. We have a body of artists who want to create. We have a body of people who want things to be better. And I know how powerful and how meaningful this art can be. And I know how necessary it is for us to change things for the better. So what are we going to do? See, as an artist and as a poet, I have dedicated my life to telling stories, to making sure that I use my voice as a way of making tangible for people the things that we go through. Because it's one thing to combat an ideology. It's one thing to argue a theory. Because there's distance there. But when I paint for you a picture of the person affected by what you're talking about so casually, it's not so easy to walk away from. It's not so easy to distance yourself from. And it's not so easy to overlook. <laughs> See, there's, there's a joy that comes with seeing children playing in an open field. There's a twinge in your gut that comes with seeing a sun-kissed testimony in tattered clothing, holding court on a corner. There is a smile that accompanies a phone call that lets you know that the next example of black excellence has been placed for the world to see. See, there's hugs that chronicle the best of times and tears that fall during the worst of times. There's pride that beams at youthful recital. There are cheers that accompany athletic achievement. And there are head nods that in a room full of judgment and expectation that lets you know that you are right where you are supposed to be. These are the signs that let us know that there is so much we're fighting for. I know a cadre of will that is talking about toppling institutions and dismantling systems of oppression in the back room of a church, two prayers from a liquor house. Down the street from a school named after an optimist, around the corner from a housing complex considered an eyesore with low property values that has birthed more blessings than bastards, these dedicated rebels are planning demonstration, coordinating childcare, identifying roles and tasks. They are building capacity with a passion unmatched. Their rebellion is a joyful noise. These are the visionaries that let us know that there is so much we're fighting for. There's promise wrestling with purpose in a classroom during the dark hour. They have heard the tales of ancestors before. They are searching for victory after. They came with questions and they intend to leave with a focused strategy. This is where developing minds seek greater understanding, past professors and syllabi together there. They realize that careers and families are distant actualizations of a tuition paid journey because today, today they are sharpening their skills at crafting a wonderfully sculpted happy ending tomorrow. Tomorrow they will march and demand pushing administrators to consider that dorm rooms are not margins and that the blueprints of their future should have the etchings of their own hands these are the tomorrows that let us know that there is so much we're fighting for. See, there are neighborhoods to reclaim. 
their lost lives to honor with our resilience, their names to say, legacies to build, ancestors to invoke, texts to review, their positions to be held, stories to be told, their lessons to be learned, insight to be gained, their programs to be developed and work to be done. My God, can't you see it? Can't you feel it right there? Hung along the horizon is truth clotheslined by angels who want us to know what the world is supposed to be there. Drying by the light of the sun is woven inspiration covered in the tears of those we have lost before the battle is won right now. In your house, there is a mirror with a glimmer in its eye and an honest tongue that wants to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with you. It has a message to deliver, a promise to give, a revolution to inspire, a revelation to share, and a dedication to let you know that if you look there, you will find everything we're fighting for. Thank you.